Well, it seems to be what you know. This is necessary for life. If you don't actually deal with the the bad, the dark, the the twisted, you're not going to be ready for it when it pounces on you as you walk down the street. And that's always been the function of fairy tales for me was to try to you know prepare people for all the surprising things that life throws at you. Uh, and I find people films in particular just tend to be more and more the same. They're more comforting is what films tend to be about. You don't want to disturb people. You don't want to make them think. And, you know, they pay good money and they want to check their brain in, fill it full of popcorn, their head, and then sit there for two hours. And they go home again. And uh, I hate that. I, 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 want the people, I want people to react. And dealing with the dark side tends to get them. It's not just about dark, but I'm trying to you know, sometimes disturb people, make them think about things the way they don't normally see them. In fact, all my films, I suppose, are trying to get people to look at another way of looking at life. And don't be afraid of your imagination. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> the interesting thing, I was always more fascinated with fairy tales and European images and knights and castles. Uh, so it, it was strange. I mean, I grew up with radio. So I think my visual sense has come from radio, because you have to work with radio. You invent it all. And, uh, and I think that's the difference between radio and television. So television is passive. All the work is done for you. You just sit there. And, and, that, and, I, and, and so I, I've often said I didn't understand where my talent, if it was talent, or, or strangeness came from, because I wasn't abused as a child. I didn't have poverty facing me every day. I didn't, I had a nice time. Um, and maybe because I had such a pleasant childhood, I thought later periods of my life could be more twisted and difficult and <laughs> unpleasant. I mean, I literally just do things that uh, you know, I'm attracted to, or basically they have to possess me. They have to take me over to the point that I just got to get it out of my system, or, or you know, I've got to spread it into the world and let other people worry about it. Uh, I, I have to believe what I'm doing. That's what it's about. And you know, I, I get a lot of scripts all the time that most of them have gone on to be very successful films, and I turn them down because I say, there's 10 other people who can make this film. I think always, the films that always you know, impressed me, that made, it, that made a difference to me, were all signature films. Film directors that signed it. Nobody else could have made that film. And I always wanted to be like that. And I guess that's why I've always fought for what I do, and that's probably why I've done as few films as I've done, because each one is a fight to say, this is my, I'm the storyteller, not you, this whole committee of executives. I don't want that. Uh, the, the irony is that, in fact, anybody who works with me, what they discover is that I'm the most collaborative person they've ever worked with, that I still am the filter. I, half what you see, like in Tideland, that's Mitch Cullen's work. He wrote that stuff. I didn't write it. It just happened to fit in the way I see the world, and, and I translated the film. But half the ideas that are coming in are other people's ideas, but... They go through me, and I say yes, no, yes, no. I, I'm just the filter. That's all I am. I'm not an auteur, a filter. This is what I am. <laughs> I'm trying to do things to get deeper in, un, under the skin, get deep down there. And you're dealing with very precise, precise things, and, and it may not even frighten people when they're watching the film, but it stays with them. There was there was a lawyer who saw Brazil, a story I was told, and afterwards he was in. And this is in New York, and after he saw the film, he went back to his office locked himself in for three days and wouldn't take calls or talk to anybody. I got to him. <laughs>
and, and I know it's a subject that pushes buttons, and it certainly pushes the buttons in those people. And I began to think, the only way we'll get the money ultimately is to find women in positions of power. And that's what actually happened, because Gabriella Martinelli here in Canada produced it in Canada, and a company called Telefilms gave us a big pile of money, and it was run by a woman then. And so that was the way we, we managed to get it done. Um, we didn't actually raise the money until I was in the final stages of Brothers Grimm, and Jeremy Thomas called me and said, we got it, but we got to shoot before the snow hits. And uh, So I actually said goodbye to the Brothers Grimm, went off and made this, and then came back and finished Brothers Grimm. Uh, under a mushroom, <laughs> tiny little creature. <laughs> and then we fed her fairy dust, and there she was, magic. <laughs> she hangs out in Vancouver and all the sort of the, the druggy places. She's, I think she was selling drugs on the streets when we found her. We said, we've got to save this kid from a terrible life. Let's make her a movie actress. <laughs> she, I got a tape sent from Vancouver and she was part of about eight kids. It was very late in the day. We were in pre-production and I was seriously at the point of about to tell Jeremy Thomas, the producer, we've got to pull the plug. We cannot make this movie because she's the movie. And this tape came in and I said, oh, there's an interesting kid. And brought her to Tideland. I mean, to Toronto, to Tideland. Isn't that wonderful? And, it's, uh, and uh, she just surprised us with the way she chose to do things. Uh, it's what you're doing in these situations: is watching the kids see what their response is. And so many of the kids have seen too much television, movies, and they behave. I think as the way they think adults expect children to behave. Not Jodell. She just surprised us. And she was. She's an extraordinary child. Uh, and. And I, I mean, I, I would, it probably won't happen, but I just think she deserves to be nominated for an Academy Award. That performance is extraordinary. The script has been tied up in, a, in this legal battle between the German insurance company and the French production company. And in July of this year, there was the final appeal went through and the Germans lost. Now, we are supposed to be getting the script back at long last. But it's been, again, the lawyers are taking so fucking long. I'm just beginning to wonder again whether I'd been lied to, but we shall see. And then if we, when and if we get it back, I just have to call Johnny and say, when are you available? It's very hard to concentrate. I've been playing with uh, a thing called Good Omens that I was working on years ago, trying to get it going again. It's a, an expensive film and it's mm -hmm. slow, and that's pretty much it. I don't know what's going to happen, really. Uh, I can't wait to finally stop talking about Thailand and then I can concentrate fully. I, d I really don't know what to do. I just, I, I don't know anybody knows. You just have to persevere. And you've got to be possessed. I mean, you've got to, if, you, if filmmaking isn't the thing you, you'll kill for, then get out of it now. There's so many easier ways of making a living and having a better life. It's, you know, if you chose, cho choose this route or route, it's going to be a bumpy, hard, hard climb, climb, climb. So I don't know. I don't know. I think it's, on one hand, it's easier now because the digital camera's out there. You can knock something off. You can get it at home. You can get it on the web. You can get into film festivals. That's still a long way from doing what I do, getting commercial films out there and being seen by a lot of people. But you do it because you have no choice in your life if you're a real filmmaker.